We now come to a very special part of this ceremony and I'm now going to invite Mr. Damien Farrell, Vice President Advancement, to present the Distinguished Alumni Award for the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences for this year 2017. Chancellor, Professor Ingrid Scheffer is the recipient of the 2017 Distinguished Alumni Award for the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences. Professor Scheffer is a Professor of Paediatric Neurology at the University of Melbourne and, a, and the Director of Paediatric Medicine at Austin Health. She has pioneered and led the fields of epilepsy genetics and epilepsy classification for over 25 years including identifying the first gene for epilepsy. In 2014, Professor Sheffer was elected as a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and also elected as the inaugural Vice President and Foundation Fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. She currently sits on the National Health and Medical Research Council. In 2014, she was received the Prime Minister's Prize for Science and was also appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to Medicine as a clinician, academic and mentor. Chancellor, in front of our newest alumni and the, class, the medical class of 2017, it is my pleasure to present to you the, the 2017 Distinguished Alumni Award recipient for the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Science, Professor Ingrid Scheffer. I now have much pleasure in inviting Laureate Professor Sheffer to deliver today's graduation address. Thank you. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, distinguished professors, families and friends, and most importantly, graduates, I would like to thank you for this great honour to return to my alma mater, of which I am immensely proud, to receive the Distinguished Alumni Award and to deliver the graduation address to our newest doctors at a momentous time in your lives. I also thank the traditional owners and custodians of the land, the people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders present today. I would especially like to thank the Dean of Medicine, Professor Christina Mitchell, who, in my last year of medical school in 1983 at the Alfred, was an inspiring tutor to our small group of med students. She continues to be an exemplary role model, both in leading the faculty to unprecedented successes and as an outstanding clinician researcher in her own right. Graduates, let me start by congratulating you on this incredible achievement. Making it through med school is no mean feat, and it is important that you take a moment out of your jam-packed lives to stop, reflect, and celebrate your success in becoming a doctor. You could not ask for a greater career, one that fosters curiosity, commitment, and compassion. I would be remiss if I also did not congratulate your proud parents, grandparents, partners, nearest and dearest, who have helped you through both the highs and the unforgettable lows in getting to this point. We often give our love and thanks too late to those close to us, so use this opportunity to thank them for their role in your success and in your lives. On Friday, as I was returning from that stay, sadly destabilised centre of the Western world, Washington DC, I contemplated the fragile balance in our lives and in our world, never more poignant than it is today with Trump, Brexit and so much discontent. Conversely, the social media feeds capturing our elation as a nation in finally passing same-sex marriage laws 
may be proud to be Australian. In these confused times, let me share my key messages to you at this pivotal point in your career. So first, life is a journey. Medicine in particular is a long journey. Don't worry so much about the end point. Being a consultant is not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> but savour the opportunities along the way. Second, there will be times when everything goes horribly wrong. It's not about what goes wrong, rather about how you handle it, how you show your resilience and learn and grow from the experience. Thirdly, you are incredibly fortunate to have had the privilege of a Monash medical education, and now the onus is upon you to truly make the world a better place. So at the risk of boring you in trying to illustrate these three pieces of advice, allow me to share the roller coaster ride of my own career in the hope that I can impart some lessons learned along the way. I grew up in middle-class Melbourne to Dutch-Jewish immigrant parents who had both suffered in the war. My mother in concentration camp in Indonesia under the Japanese and my father as an interpreter for the Dutch army, having had to stop his university studies in economics at the Sorbonne in Paris. My father died of a stroke when I was 13, leaving my mother a widow with two children, me and my intellectually disabled brother. She retrained as a nurse educator at the Alfred while caring for my brother and me and her ailing mother. Growing up in this setting gave me a deep understanding of the impact of a sick child on a family, an insight that has been of immense value as a paediatric neurologist caring for desperately sick children. Medical school, it's one of the best periods in your life with few cares and responsibilities and time to make lifelong friends. Indeed, I am fortunate to have my best friend from medical school here today, Dr. Cathy Wallace, a truly exceptional GP. We have shared the remarkable joy of seeing our children, Eddie and Hannah, develop a similarly close friendship since starting Monash Medicine together six years ago. You will come to realise the uni unique nature of your medical school friendships, built on hours poring over cadavers in anatomy, painting each other's surface anatomy, practising examinations on each other, and most importantly, coming to understand the complexities of our patients' stories and confronting fundamental human issues such as poverty, death and grief. Cherish these friends and keep them in your lives. After my internship at Dandenong, I crossed the Yarra to train as a paediatrician at the Royal Children's Hospital. But life isn't meant to be easy. After a year there, I had a stark lesson in medical politics when I naively learned that I hadn't worked for the right people, those who determined the residence positions, and I was sent into exile. Not quite Siberia, just to Adelaide. <laughs> I ventured forth with trepidation for my second year of paediatrics. After what started out to be a terrifying year where I was thrown into the neonatal intensive care unit, it turns out to be a cloud with a silver lining. I moved away, grew to be more independent, gained the perspective of Australia beyond Melbourne, and made new friends. The next year, I re-entered the Children's Hospital program here and completed my specialist exams. Everyone's career takes unexpected turns, and it is those who seize these opportunities that reap, reap the benefits. I wanted to be a paediatric neurologist. My career took yet another twist when I found there was no clear training path in Melbourne, particularly for someone lacking a Y chromosome. I succeeded in finding an alternative, a training post at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children in London. They showed me I could think differently about the patients I saw. I worked under two fabulous mentors, a child neurologist and a neurogeneticist, both of whom had literally written the textbooks on their respective specialties. They opened my eyes to the benefits and fascination of research. Until being immersed in that academic environment, I had not contemplated research, as I was keen on being a doctor and seeing patients. 
This was an invaluable experience as it showed me that research takes one's daily clinical practice to a completely different level. To put it simply, research changes the way you think. My time in London led me to consider a research degree. I had secured a PhD drug trial in Parkinson's disease in Melbourne, but fortunately for me, the funding fell through. So I commenced my PhD with no funding at all and worked full time for 10 months with no salary. And in fact, my husband could write me off as a tax liability. I was, however, extremely fortunate to end up working with Professor Sam Berkovic in epilepsy, then my PhD supervisor, and now my lifetime research collaborator. Ironically, when I'd finished in London, I mentioned to my neurogenetics mentor that I was contemplating a PhD on the genetics of epilepsy. He laughed and said, mm, you'll never get anywhere with that. To his credit, some 10 years later, he emailed me, admitting he was wrong. I want to take a brief detour to commend to you the joys of teaching and mentoring. Take the time to teach wherever you are in your career, be it the clinic, the classroom, or the community. Last week in Washington at the American Epilepsy Society, I had the joy of our annual Epilepsy Fellows Dinner, where we host 20 or more former fellows. They now lead their own research groups in all corners of the world, from Beijing to Philadelphia, Frankfurt, Montreal, Bangkok, to name a few. I treasure these relationships and the opportunities to grow the next leaders in medical research. I never thought I would be any good at research. It took me 21 long years from finishing school to finishing my PhD, giving birth to two amazing sons along the way, and spending far too much time on the call of clinical work. My PhD resulted in the discovery of four new epilepsy syndromes, led directly to the identification of the first gene for epilepsy, and I received the University of Melbourne's Chancellor's Prize. I encourage you to follow the winding path that serendipity offers you in the years to come. I never set out to be a scientist. In fact, I only realised that I was one on emerging from the escalator at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris in 2012 to see a 10 by 5 metre billboard of myself as a L'Oreal UNESCO Woman in Science Laureate. Until then, I had thought of myself as a clinical researcher and certainly not a scientist. Life as a clinician scientist is difficult to encapsulate. Let me tell you about Sophie. Sophie was a 20-year-old young woman with what was then called vaccine encephalopathy, where whooping cough vaccine had allegedly caused uncontrolled seizures and developmental slowing. When we meticulously dissected her early history, we realised that it sounded like a severe genetic form of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. So we looked for the genetic mutations in the sodium channel gene that causes Dravet syndrome and bingo, we found them. We discovered that Sophie's disorder was not due to the vaccine at all, but rather due to her underlying gene mutation, and she was destined to have Dravet syndrome. This finding debunked the myth of so-called vaccine encephalopathy, countering the arguments mounted by the anti-vaccine campa campaigners. This example highlights the unique value that clinical researchers, you in fact, can bring to scientific discovery. Every patient that you see has the potential to tell you something and inform your understanding of the biology of their disease and ultimately transform outcomes for patients. It is the skill of the clinical researcher that sees these pearls in the patients, asks the right questions and takes the science to the next level. Not only have I realised the challenges of um, being a clinical researcher, but also those of being a woman in medicine and science. I wanted to touch for a moment on the ongoing inequities for women in our society, despite statements to the contrary. Women, I implore you to have confidence in yourselves, to take a seat at the table, and free, feel free to lead as you will. Men, 
I encourage you to recognise that inequities still exist, to support the women alongside you, and also in the revel, to, to revel in the joys of fatherhood and take the time to do so. Your university education is both a privilege and a burden. It gives you unique stake, status and key responsibilities. One of the most important gifts of a tertiary education is that it teaches you to think. It is incumbent upon you to harness these skills, to let your imagination fly and transform our world into a better place. I hope that some moments from my career have illustrated how the most challenging steps are often the most rewarding, that hard work underpins all career success that you should follow your heart and not settle for less. And the future is yours. It is up to you what you make of it. When I reflect on what I would have done differently, I would have liked a wise mentor to tell me less, to be less worried about the end point and more intent on enjoying the journey. So wherever your career takes you, enjoy the journey. <laughs>